Uh, let's welcome in our first guest. She is the Senate Education Chairwoman, Amy Grady. Senator Grady, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure to have you. Second day of school here in Berkeley County. Have you begun school as well? You know, teachers, we started back last Thursday, but our first day with students is tomorrow. I'm actually in my classroom right now preparing things while I'm on the phone with you. And, and what grade do you teach? I teach fourth grade. Fourth grade. So do you have a little bit of decoration going on inside the classroom this morning? You know, I, I don't focus a lot on decorating my classroom. I think most of it of what you need to do comes from things that you're planning and the, the, the culture that you actually environment that you create. So um, I'm a veteran teacher and I always say, I like to say that I don't waste time doing all kinds of cutesy little things on my walls. I feel like I need to do other things and that's what I focus on. So do you have the alphabet hanging there? You know what? I do not have the alphabet in fourth grade. Yeah, I guess they they know all that stuff by Kids now. Kids probably already know yeah. the alphabet by then. We we well, hope. I don't know. We saw some well, test we would scores. Hope so. <laughs> yes, we would yes. Hope so. Yeah, uh, our producer is a substitute teacher, Senator Grady. So he may at times, Dylan, chime in with a question or two for you as well, because he does three days a week in the classroom, uh, too, here in Berkeley County. Just in case you're yeah. a fourth voice. Uh, let's yeah. let's talk about the school year in 2024, Senator Grady. And uh, here at North Middle, the state has taken over that school because of poor performance and behavior issues uh, as well. So it's something we'll be keeping a close eye on too this year. Is that something that you as the education chairwoman will be watching also? You know, we, we always need to be watching that. Um, I think, I think a lot of, a lot of times the number one thing that you mentioned there, I know poor performance um, is, is important, but the number one thing I heard when you said that was also uh, the behavior issues. I think the behavior issues directly correlate with poor performance and um, those are some things that we've really got to get a handle on um, and allow teachers to have more control of their classroom. You folks tried to do that previously in the previous legislative session, but the word is that that help didn't filter down to the classroom as quickly or maybe as clearly or thoroughly as you folks had hoped would happen. Did you hear the same? Um, you know, last this last session, we passed a bill in 2023 that ad addressed middle school and high school students. Um, it addressed uh, the behavior issues that you're seeing. And what I'm hearing from teachers is that a lot of times um, it depends on the administrator. And so I think there needs to be a little more direction given on exactly what's expected there. Uh, but the one we tried to pass this past session in 2024 was elementary behavior, and it made it until the, the, the final minutes of the last night, and the House wouldn't concur. So, you know, where I'm going to try again this year, it was a priority last year. It's going to be a priority this year because I think we really, really have to allow teachers to have the ability to say in their classrooms they feel unsafe or that other, other students are unsafe because of a student's behavior. I think that, you know, a teacher's discretion is one of the greatest things that they have, and we allow them to use their discretion on almost every other thing that they're making decisions on in their classroom, yet we don't allow their discretion and behavior issues. And so I think it's really important that we allow them to have a say in whether or not a child is in their room or not. And um, we're going to try to pass it again this year, and I'm hopeful. There's all sorts of rights that students have in West Virginia, you have the right to a free public education. What are the rights for students who really want to get an education but can't because of the distractions in the classroom? What are their rights? You know, that, that's always my question, Rob. My, my question and my argument has always been that. It seems like we're always focusing so much on, uh, you know, if we have a classroom of 20 students and there's one who is a behavior problem, and what I mean by behavior problem is our outbursts and, you know, throwing things and, and a safety issue for t the teacher and for the other students, we focus a lot on getting that child help, and we should. We focus a lot on what their needs are. We make, we have um, different, in different types of expectations for them we we get them an IEP to to allow their behaviors pretty much and the other students in the classroom you know they're just expected to have to deal with it and I think that's a huge problem because we have a lot of students that come to school to learn who don't who don't face those types of behaviors at home so that's something that's new to them they've never experienced trauma like many of these kids who are exhibiting the behaviors do they've never experienced something like that yet they're being exposed to it in their classroom where they're coming to learn where they should feel safe and they don't feel safe and that's not fair and we have to focus on those students more than the student who's causing the problems and I think that's where we're kind of lost is we have always focused on 
the one student who's causing the problems instead of focusing on the majority of students. Well, test scores in the past. This is were, Jonathan Bodwell. Oh, I'm sorry, Jonathan Bodwell. Test scores in the past were a lot better. And, I mean, I remember when I went to school, I mean, the, the behavior, the kids who were causing behavior problems, they stuck them all in one classroom so mm -hmm. that everybody else was able to just concentrate on learning. And I, and I think we may be pandering too much to the, the one or two kids that are causing the problems instead of doing what we should do is concentrating on the kids who want to learn, the kids who are going to learn, and the kids who are struggling to learn because of having to deal with the extraneous uh, stuff I didn't stuff that's going on from the other kid I mean I feel bad for those kids and they obviously have some issues but isn't it more important to make sure we're educating the other 95 percent of the kids instead of worrying about dealing with the one you're speaking my language Jonathan <laughs> Aww. I have I yeah, I, I, I always say that. You know, it's not that we don't care about those kids. It's That's not it at all. We do care about them, and we want what's best for them. But whenever we are focusing so many resources on one student out of 20, you know, that that's a problem. And we're in the business of educating minds. And like you said, we used to have higher test scores. You know, whenever – I don't know how old you are, but when I was in school, I remember whenever you had a behavior issue, you were removed from the classroom because the teacher's job was to teach for us to learn. And now teachers have so many other responsibilities and schools take so many other things into consideration as well. You know, we, we not only teach students now, but we provide everything. We don't, you know, the parental responsibility has, has gone down because the schools will take care of it. You know, we send food home on the weekends. Now I'm not saying these are bad things. I'm just saying our focus is a lot of times on, on, on more on the wrong thing than just, just educating our students. So we send food home. We worry about that. We provide clothing closets. We provide every single thing that a parent used to provide. Now they depend on the school to do it. And so our focus isn't just solely on educating kids like it used to be, and it should be. It's on all the other things. And let me ask you guys one other question. How many professions could you would you say that um, a professional would have to put up with being hit, kicked, spit on, cussed at, things thrown at, and not be able to do something about it? There I'm, aren't uh, any. I'm guessing none. I'm going with none. Right. Yes, but teachers, we're expected to deal with that in our classrooms and just put up with it and be okay with it. And people wonder all the time, you know, we're losing teachers and the focus is always on pay. And pay is an issue, but it's not the biggest issue. The majority of times we lose teachers because of behaviors like this and the fact that their hands are tied and they're not going to do this job for the amount, the money they're making because of how hard it is, because of things like this. And there's no support. And so this the bill we had this past session would try to give them th their voice in saying, hey, I feel unsafe. My students are unsafe. I need this child removed from my classroom and not brought back until we have a plan in place. Well, I had a, I had a son who had, who had decided he was going to teach this year. He just graduated from college. And we talked to some of my teacher friends. And resoundingly, every single one of them said, what are you, stupid? You don't want to do that. You don't want to get into this. It's so much different than it was. We have no control. And it's, it's horrible. And I, I just think that's terrible because there, there's nothing more important. Public safety and educating our kids, those are the two most important things that our, our government provides, that our society provides. And to hamstring the teachers who are amazing, wonderful people who just want to teach kids, I think it's horrible. So, Senator, mm -hmm. this, this is John Gilstrap. Let, let's shift into the corrective phase here. Um, yeah, how, put something in the form of a recommendation. Do we... If we could start all over again, I understand everybody has to live in the lanes that are that are constructed for them at this point. But if we could start all over again, would we acknowledge that the education system in West Virginia is far too structured from the top down uh, with, with the State Board of Education and and, and then everything flows from there? If, would it be better if we had more local control of the education system from county to county or district to district? You know, I can see both sides of that, John, honestly. Um, I think that local control is always good because every county is different. However, I also think there are situations, a lot of situations, in which there has to be control from the top down. And, you, you know, you just spoke of one earlier where there's takeover of a school because of behavior problems and at poor academic performance because 
those two things together, there's no way that school's going to bring itself out, right? So I think there's, I think it really depends on the situation. It's not a cookie cutter um, approach to anything because education, you know, not only do you have different students with different different abilities and their individuals, but schools are also the same way, and schools within a community are the same way. They're all different, and then you know, communities within a county, they're all different, and so um, local control is really great if it's done correctly. I think so, and being run by the state is really great if it's done correctly but i think it's just different for different situations and i'm sorry if that doesn't answer your question but i wish there was an answer that we could say this would work and this would work for everybody but you know there's not now i I teach in mason county and so you know we are we look to we have two schools or two county school systems right beside us um who are top five in the state and you know and so work i'm constantly asking myself what are they doing that we're not doing we it's not that they have smarter kids that they have they have different kids than we do we're from the same general area so you know there's got to be something different and i think a lot of times we have to maybe look to each other and um and pick each other's brains to see you know what's working for you that could work for me you know and a lot of times i think that's too much competition's a good thing but i think sometimes counties compete and schools compete with with each other instead of trying to help each other you know i could keep going but there's a lot of different things that i think would work um depending on each situation well i I write books and movies for a living so i'm always looking for the happy ending here somewhere so and Mm -hmm. and you know there's some iconic school related films that are out there you know lean on me comes to mind and and where you have the powerful administrator the powerful principal who comes in and just on his own overcomes the burdens of the administration and makes changes there at that school and kind of resets the, the 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 paradigm can that actually be done by an energetic imaginative administrator at a school within the structure that's provided in West Virginia? Do we have that kind of power? I think so. I do. I think uh, a lot of the things that you see or you hear from teachers um, whenever they're frustrated or they feel like they can't do what they're supposed to do is because they have a lack of support from their administrator. And that's their direct administrator in their building. And I think um, that we've kind of sometimes gotten out of um, – who we hire as administrators, building administrators, and every single one that I've had has been wonderful. But I've also heard horror stories from others that, uh, where they've had a principal who has never taught in the classroom, never been in the classroom one day. And I don't know how you can, you know, be the guiding person for your school if you've never been in the classroom, you know. So I think a lot of times um, that, that could happen. But I think respect, and um, it has to be somebody who – like I said, teachers respect, but also that has the heart for understanding what's going on in a classroom. You can't just stick somebody in that position and expect them to know exactly what to do or to help their school. But everybody, of course, has good intentions, I think. But I think it really depends on um, their their experiences, and that would help, help with that, if that makes sense. Um, for the most part, I think a teacher has the most effect on it because teachers are the ones who are with their students every single day. And I think, I think teachers are the ones who can have the greatest effect amount of effect on, on the entire school. Well, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, if, if little Johnny didn't perform to expectation and therefore I give him a C or a D and then, then his mom objects and then takes it to the principal, and the principal says, okay, Mr. Gilstrap, you've got to give him the B that his mom wants to have, you know, the horror stories that we hear. The teacher really does not have the impact in that case, right? So, well, you're right, yeah, in that, in that case, but that's, I would surely hope that wouldn't work, that wouldn't happen, because the principal shouldn't be telling a teacher to change a grade because a parent complained about it. Um, you know, there, there needs to be data, there needs to be records that show why little Johnny deserves that C. Not not just because the teacher feels they're not at a certain point. That's why we collect data. That's why we have documentation to prove this is this is where the student is, and this is why. You know, I, I gotta even say, in the, if we flip flop that, how many students have received A's in classes, right? Um, because teachers might say this is easier than arguing with a parent. I'm gonna give them an A, but then on the test at the end of the year, they show that they're not proficient. So you know. Um, I think that it, the culture that a teacher creates can have the biggest impact, whether that's with parents or with students or even just within the school. Uh, not saying the principal does not have impact at all, but I don't think one is more important than the other. I think that the teacher just, though, spends more time with the student and also spends more time speaking with the parent, or should, that can create that 
positive in, effect. Senator Amy Grady is our guest here. She is the Senate Education Chair. Jonathan, did you have a question? Yes, yeah, Senator. Let's uh, let's change gears a little bit to the teacher shortage. I am a small business owner. I own an insurance agency. I've got a lot of friends who are business owners, and I'm I'm a capitalist. Let me just mm-hmm. say that I think teachers are really underpaid at this point. I think mm-hmm. when we did not have a serious teacher shortage, um, yeah, teachers were paid fine. But when you have, if, if I'm hiring my industry and all of a sudden it costs me twenty or $30,000 more a year to hire and get and maintain and retain quality people, then I have to pay that. If you look at Sheets that was paying $12 an hour and is now paying $18, $19 an hour, has there been anything discussed about just paying teachers a lot more, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year more? Because that is what the market will bear. The market is currently saying teachers are vastly underpaid because we don't have enough teachers. If we had enough teachers, teachers can say, oh, we need more, but heck, they're, they're enough. When you do not have enough people to staff in private business, You just, you have to pay a lot more. You just, you have to do it. Has there been talk of that? It seems like every year we talk about how we can raise teacher pay. It does. It seems like, and you know, I've been in there for four years, so I feel like every year we've we've talked about that. And it really goes nowhere. And I can't really explain to you why it goes nowhere. So I've, you know, tried to shift my discussion as a teacher and as the education chair to other things that we can do to create an environment that makes teachers feel more appreciated um, with a smaller, a lower salary or a smaller increase in pay. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that there's anybody that could argue that teachers deserve higher pay. We've discussed um, locality pay, you know, for instance, where you guys are in the panhandle there. I mean, losing teachers to, to Maryland because uh, it's what, $15,000 oh, a year. Oh, heck, you go. I had a teacher friend of mine. She went, uh, she drives 10 minutes farther. She made 23000 more going right. over the and border so, into Maryland. I mean, it. Yep. Yeah, so we have discussed that. We've discussed locality pay. Um, we've discussed, you know, performance. I've tried to do performance based bonuses, you know, just like you said that small businesses or businesses do. When somebody is um, doing a great job, you want to give them an incentive. So we've tried to figure out how to do performance based incentives, you know, just just to let them know, hey, we're watching, and if you're doing a great job, we want we want you to feel appreciated. We want you to know that we appreciate it. Um, it's just that it seems like those discussions go nowhere, and I wish I had a reason to tell you that they do, but it it's just seems like it's we bring it up, and then nothing nothing ever happens of it. Um, we I think our starting teacher salary is somewhere like seven or eight thousand dollars less than than the average starting teacher salary. Uh, given the cost of living in most parts of West Virginia is a little bit lower than everywhere else. I understand that. But, you know, I truly believe I know pay is an issue, but we all knew coming into being a teacher. We all knew what to expect with the pay. I truly believe the things that we came in for that we didn't expect, like the behavior issues that we're dealing with, things like that. I think if we give more support there, I think teachers will be happier and we won't see them leaving as much because those are the things they didn't know they were stepping into. You know what you're stepping into with your salary, but you don't know what you're stepping into whenever things like this happen. And so that's why we're losing people, and I really feel like that's what we have to focus on for a little while is is making the job um, better, I guess, you know, that for lack of a better term, making the job something that people will want to do and You know, teaching is a work of heart. You hear that all the time. It really is. You know if you're a teacher or if you're not. But nobody's going to come into this profession because they want to do it for a low pay. They're coming into the profession because they feel their their calling is to be a teacher. And so, you know, we, we just have to make it, I guess, better for them while they're here. About three minutes left. Our producer, Chillin Dylan Bishop, who is a substitute teacher, has a question for you, Amy. Go ahead, uh, Dill. I try to, trying to kind of tie both of the, points that we've been focusing on here i think part of the bind that we sometimes put ourselves in is that uh as we should we want every single student to get the best education they can and the most normal education they can and that's why maybe sometimes the schools are a little more hesitant to pull a kid out to a classroom but we do still have those you know learning disability behavior disability uh, classrooms those teachers i've subbed for them before uh, do we think that maybe part of this could be if we gave the if we had more of those positions, if more funding was given to those sort of positions, and and more support was given to those? And you kind of just uh, uh, got into that point in your in your last uh, statement there that 
this would help the issue if there was more support, more ability to take some kids out of the classroom uh, and you know, put them with these specialized teachers. And, and just in general, how many of these educational issues do you think if we just put more funding towards them, uh, it would give the help that we needed? Amy, about Thank two minutes. Don't. Yeah, thank you, Dylan. I think um, I think you know you hit the nail on the head there. The, the salaries aren't the only issue, but we um, with these behaviors, we do have to have like behavior support specialists in each school. We need to have people who are specialized to deal with the behaviors that we're seeing, um, and we don't really have that right now. I don't even think we have the professionals available to hire um, to do that. You know, we've got a, several different things. When we were talking about salaries, I also want to throw in math teachers. You know, we don't have very many certified math teachers because we can't compete with the um, with the private sector on people who have a, ma a degree of some kind. We've got to think outside of the box to do that. But the behavior, the behaviors. Um, I think if we did provide more money for behavior support programs or behavior support classrooms, I think that would have, be more beneficial than just giving a pay raise all across the board. And you know that might not be popular, but I really think that's where we're at in in our you know, our, our education system right now is that we've got to figure out a way. Many of these kids come from the drug, drug epidemic. Many of these kids come from homes where, you know, parents are absent or they're being raised by grandparents. Many are foster kids. And so we have to figure out a way that we can support them at school without losing the others, you know, without losing the other students. And that's the big focus that I want us to make sure we're focusing on are those students that we need to reach and we need to make sure they're safe and they, they feel like they can learn while we're also dealing with these students, but in a separate setting so that it's not in front of the others. And I think it's, it's a balance that's hard to find. Um, it's not nothing we, we do is going to be perfect, but I think we've got to try something or we're not going to see anything that's going to change for the better. It's just going to continue to get worse. Senator Grady, thank you so much for your time this morning. We very much enjoyed the interview. Good stuff. Thank you, Rob. Have a great day and a great school year. Thank you. You too. I'll see you later. Take care.